Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, a very warm welcome to this latest uh, support group. Uh, our first dedicated to uh, those of you caring for uh, and about someone living with a rare dementia in the early or mid stages. Uh, a brief introduction. My name is Seb Crutch. I'm one of the psychologists at the Dementia Research Centre in RDS, and I'll let Nikki introduce herself. Hi everybody, lovely to see you this morning. Um, I'm Nikki Zimmerman, I'm the direct support team lead here at Rare Dementia Support. Um, and as we have said sadly uh, many more times than we would have liked to, we're sorry not to be with you in person, um, but we're really delighted that so many people are able to join today at uh, this our first uh, new, slightly new format uh, meeting. Um, so I guess I've always an important question of any meeting that you kindly come to um, with us or with others is who's in the room. And so we are very, very conscious there will be still a wide range of you here today. There will be some of you who have been diagnosed very recently, for whom this is all terribly new. Um, that might be in the last few months with all the difficulties of getting a diagnosis and in these distant social distance times. Um, or others of you who've been living with these conditions uh, for much longer. We know that some of you will come in, frankly, in shock at all of this holds, this diagnosis and this situation you found yourselves in. But there'll be others here who have had a little bit more time to come to grasp uh, what, what this means for them and their families and their friends and their lives and their identity um, and who are finding ways to adjust and live this new pattern of life. We know that with some people who have begun to accept um, what is happening and to make changes and other people who actually quite rightly want to rage against um, everything that is happening to you and to say this isn't right, this isn't, this isn't what I want it to be, to be living right now. There will be people amongst you who feel really well supported by friends and family, albeit at a distance and maybe online, but who have found that love, that care, that support, that understanding, that listening ear when you need it. And others of you who will be arriving here today desperate, you will feel positively jealous that some people might feel like that. Others, some of you will feel isolated, disconnected, um, or maybe that your diagnosis has, has created fractures in relationships that you previously thought were sound. All of these things are true. You know, there's some of you will be feeling in control today and you'll be able to hear things in the talks and the information and the experiences that are shared that you'll be able to use and others of you will just be feeling like you're hurting out of control and just needing someone to catch you. Um, some of you in this very moment will be arriving feeling rested and positive, others will be in a tough spot at the moment or just quite unsure which direction you're facing. Whatever of those things trying for you, or whatever other experience you're in at the moment, you are warmly, warmly welcome here. We don't, of course, uh, promise or offer to provide solutions because we know that this is a different experience for all of you. But we hope that in amongst the talks that Nikki's about to tell you about um, and the short presentations that kind of been made, both by members of the team and other members such as yourselves of this group, and that we will be able to find perspectives that help, help you to take a new view on a challenge you're facing or to find renewed reassurance or fresh inspiration about what tomorrow might look like and how to cope with today. Um, as I mentioned, this is a, the first time we've split uh, the carer group into uh, early and mid stages and a separate group for late stages. Those two are not exclusive. You are welcome to attend any of our meetings that are appropriate to you. We only do that because of our eagerness to respond to feedback from our members, from you, saying that you want to be able to speak freely about the experiences without worrying about whether that's perhaps insensitive or inappropriate for someone else of the stage of conditions that they're living with. Um, so this is a trial run. Please do, as always, feel free to give us feedback and we want to know what you want from these meetings and to offer it um, as sincerely and um, hopefully useful as we can. Um, the other brief reminder, which I hope will be powerfully clear through, throughout, is that there may be things raised for you today, um, which uh, particularly without us being with you face to face, you find it difficult to raise or that raise concerns for you. We always say to try and go away from these meetings, taking what's useful and leaving what's behind, but we know that's easier said than done. And so Nikki, Claire, um, Hannah, Libby, and the rest of the direct support, Trish, and the rest of the direct support team are available 
to you outside of these meetings for one-to-one support. We're happy to call you and you're certainly very always very happy for you to call us. Um, and we don't want you to go away from this being unsettled or unsure. Um, please do ask if you have any further um, I will reappear at various points in between uh, the different presentations um, to link things together and then to host the question and answer session at the, at the end. Uh, for now, I'm going to hand over to Nikki um, to tell you about um, what we're going to be talking about this morning. Um, but I did just encourage you throughout, please do feel free to offer questions in the chat box here um, or by email. And I will try and pick up as many of those comments and reflections as I can at the end. And it might be that you just want to say, I really agree with that. Or you might want to say, that's total rubbish. That's not my experience at all. Whatever your reaction to anything that's said, um, please do feel free to share it. Um, that's part of the conversation that you want to um, bring, even though we're not all touching. So, so for now, enough of me um, over to Nikki to talk about the agenda today. Thank you, Seb. Um, I'm in a slightly different part of London from Seb, because if you could hear in the background, he's in a very rainy part of London. If anybody thought that he was in a typing pool, you are mistaken. It is just the rain on his roof. So we apologise for that. Um, and hopefully the sun will come out short. Uh, sort of while we're on our meeting today but um, it's lovely to be here as I said and we've got 124 people joining us today so it's a huge part of our membership which you know we're very pleased that you're spending the time sort of to be with us we've got a great agenda I hope um, and obviously we're looking at sort of basing it towards the early and mid stages. So we're going to start off with a recording from the direct support team. Um, myself and Trish and Hannah are going to be talking about advanced care planning. We are then really um, lucky to be joined by one of our members, um, Helen, who has spoken very candidly to Claire about her experience of caring for her husband uh, who has uh, dementia with Lewy bodies. So uh, again, we're really appreciative of carers who spend their time and want to talk to us and share their experiences with um, others of you out there. We know this is really valued uh, from you and it, their experiences will resonate with a lot of you out there today. And again, we do urge you to send in some questions um, for Helen afterwards in the uh, panel. She will be there able to answer some of your questions. Uh, Alicia and Chris have been working really hard on some staging um, uh, analysis. So they'll be feeding back what they've been doing with the, the research into this. So that'll be really interesting uh, and updating for everybody. And then Claire and Livy have done a lovely presentation on assisted technology, which I hope will be really useful for you. We've uh, reached out to a lot of our members to ask their opinions on this of what they felt it's uh, really helpful for them. So hopefully you'll be able to take some tips away from that today. And then we will end the day as we normally do as a Q&A session and we've got a, a fantastic panel uh, today who'll be able to answer any of your questions, whether they be slightly clinical, slightly based on research, on support or generally what's actually happening today. So please, as I said, get your questions in for us. So we're going to start with the recording that we did um, a couple of weeks ago uh, to um, enlighten you a little bit on some advanced care planning. Um, I hope you enjoy this. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you again this morning. Unfortunately, we're still online, not in person, but um, we're continuing these going to hopefully provide some support for you. I'm here this morning with my wonderful colleagues, Hannah and Trish, part of the direct support team or ever expanding direct support team, which we're pleased to announce. We just want to talk to you a little bit this morning about what health professionals are out there to help you and a bit about advanced care planning and how important that is. I'm going to start by talking about sort of how important your GP is and how important it is to have a good relationship with your GP. If you feel you don't have a good relationship with your GP, please try and change and get another one that you can actually speak openly to because they're going to be so important throughout the journey um, ahead. Um, and thing you really need to focus on is the GP is going to be the gatekeeper for any onward referrals. So any other additional needs that you'll have within your healthcare or your partner will have within their healthcare will come under the GP. So it's important to have that good relationship and to re register with the GP as that named carer. 
they may ask you about a lasting power of attorney for this or they may agree to do this without that it's just so the data can be shared so they can have communication with you so you know what's going on as well and it also gives you the opportunity to have double appointments with the GP and those are the appointments that it may take longer for your partner's needs but also your needs are important as a carer as well so that really has to be taken into consideration and as well as sort of the GP in the community it's really important to look to see what other services are available Sometimes the GP has a link worker, worker which we can help with that. But all of the voluntary groups can be really, really helpful in providing that support to the community. So it's things like registering with the Alzheimer's Society. They deal with all sorts of different forms of dementia, but they will know the landscape and what's available in your local area. And there be, might be sort of criteria for this as well. Um, each location is very different. There is definitely a postcode lottery in the UK. We know that, but it's really sort of finding out what services are there for you. Age UK are always a fantastic organisation as well. They are often commissioned with various different services. But one important service is, is helping with uh, form filling for entitlements and benefits and things like that. Um, they can be really helpful. They know the buzzwords to get things through. And they are actually commissioned to do this service in a lot of places. It's also really important to be registered as a carer with a carer centre as well. They can offer so much support for you as a carer. And it's really important with that registration that you get the emergency carers card to take with you. And this will show people that you are a carer. It has lots of benefits. But one of the things it does entitle you to or your partner to receive if there is an emergency and things need to be put into place straight away there's 72 hours active care which will go into place just for peace of mind for you but they are very good with lots of services for carers to who really look after all your needs so it's so important that these people um, know about your details and what situation you're in i'm going to hand over now to trish and she's going to talk a little bit more Hello, hi. Um, it's important, I suppose, to plan when um, when you're living with dementia or when you're supporting someone who's living with dementia. Things can change. They might change very slowly over a long period of time or they might change unexpectedly rather quickly. So we need to think about what might happen next always with dementia. What, what might we need to think about? And maybe whilst you might need some emergency care from the carer centre, you might need support suddenly what you might also need is more ongoing support now we know that when people are living with dementia their friends and family are going to be hopefully their first port of call but not always available they don't always live nearby and for some friends and family particularly friends illness is very difficult and they might withdraw a little bit because they don't know what to say or how to say it and so you might need professionals to help you and the first port of call for that usually is going to be a home care team and again, a home care team, you can find a local home care arranger and that can often be signposted from your local authority. Now, whilst you might not want to go to the local authority or the council or the social services straight away, at some point it's really necessary to do that because they will have a list of approved providers, providers that they trust. But it's important that social services also might be able to help you. And the best way they can do that is to come out and do an assessment. And they will do, first of all, send you a self-assessment and a self-assessment form is a long form, but it's not a difficult form. It's a lot of repetition questions around different areas and they're different domains of need. Need around nutrition, can you cook, can you help yourself to eat, can you shop, can you keep your house clean, can you get yourself to the toilet, can you um, maintain relationships, can you work? You know, they're sort of questions that you'd expect to ask. Can you get dressed, washed and showered? And you're answering questions on need. And it's important at this point, to talk about what you can't do, not what you can do. And that's difficult for people with dementia because obviously people are pr proud. They want to talk about their abilities, their skills and all the things they've maintained. But actually, in order to, to reach a criteria for a full assessment from a social worker, really you have to trigger some need. And the fact is, once you have enough need, the local authority will then provide you with an assessment, an assessment that they'll do based on the same domains, exactly the same domain. So part of that would also be a financial assessment. And that means they will ask you personal questions about your monies. 
And believe me, it's quite detailed, a financial assessment. So the important thing to remember is all healthcare, which Hannah will talk about, is free at the point of delivery still, just about, we hope. But social care has always been and, and continues to be means tested, and they will assess you individually. And then my advice would be that you would have a carer's assessment, a separate one, the people who are caring for you in the home, the primary carer, and that that would be very much a separate assessment. So you might qualify for some carer's hours, even if the person you care for doesn't qualify for care hours. So you, it's worth doing this separately and your monies will be looked at separately and your income too. Then you may qualify for a care package. You might have to contribute to that financially, but they can help you point, point you in the right direction for some good care services locally. And those services will help you support your loved one or support yourself, live as independently as possible and maintain and as ordinary a life as possible in the community for as long as possible. In that, I would also suggest that you have the conversation about the future and other changes. So it's really important at this point to think about power of attorney. Now the power of attorney forms are a bit longer. There are two areas. You will have health and welfare, you will have financial. They're two applications. It's important probably to do both. It doesn't have to be the same people who does both. You can have different people or a team of people and you might choose their skills or their knowledge of you. And a team of people would be jointly your power of attorney. And then there's a way that you can choose jointly or jointly and severally. My advice, you would be that it's jointly and severally because jointly means every decision has to be made by everybody that's on that form. Whereas jointly and severally means that lots of decisions could be made, and particularly smaller ones, be made by an individual on that form that you have given the power to. You need to do all this while the person living with dementia has capacity and they can give or donate their power to the person that they trust. And this takes a little while, it usually takes sort of eight to 12 weeks, goes to the office of public guardian, it will be sent back to you and stamped and only, and only when it's authorised does it exist. The financial one can come into being at any point the health and welfare one will only come into being when the person living with dementia, if and when they lose capacity, and then you'll make decisions on their behalf in their best interests. So there's lots to think about and there's lots more to know, but consider all those options. And remember, we can live well for, with dementia as long as we do some good planning and get the right support. And I'll pass you on to the lovely Hannah. Hello, hi. Um, yeah, I'm coming to talk about health professionals and a number of people that you may come across that you might find useful um, and support you in the community caring for someone with dementia. Um, the first person is um, the speech and language therapist um, and their role is really to help not just the speech um, and language but also help you um, cope and communicate with someone with dementia and give you strategies and age to help you communicate. And you can speak to your GP about getting referred to them. Um, also another professional is an um, occupational therapist. And their role is really um, to help people improve ability to function as independently as possible. So their role is to assess someone at home and see what can be put in place to make it safe and create independence. So things, it could be from a stair lift, it could be something in the kitchen to help you open a tin, it could be for a chair for a shower. Um, also, another professional is Admiral Nursing. Um, Admiral Nurses are specialist dementia nurses um, and their role is about supporting families. So I'm the Admiral Nurse at RDS, so I support carers, people living with dementia who are members of RDS, but Admiral Nurses are up and down the country. And if you want to have, um, contact with an Admiral Nurse, you can check Dementia UK website and there's a map and they will tell you where the services are and support and they're really there to listen, share their knowledge and interventions and just sometimes just get what you're going through or sometimes just having that person to talk to is really important and powerful because not everyone understands dementia but when you have a, a rarer type it can be quite hard um, to find other people in situation and people to understand. Um, so yeah, that's what, um, any questions, please contact RDS and I'm willing to help and support any carers. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Trish. What a fantastic team we've got. It's amazing. Um, Hannah and Trish will both be on the Q&A panel today. So please get your questions in and ask any questions. And if you want to contact us at any time afterwards, we're always available to support you. So you can email us at at contact at rare dementia support.org. Thank you very much.
and um, stay safe, everybody. Brilliant. It's really great to see how our um, direct support team has increased in capacity over the last year and that we'll be able, we're able to offer so much more specialist um, help to all our members. Absolutely, and really, really helpful so to flag up the number of different professionals who can provide um, uh, services and support. So I think so often people have a particular conception of dementia and think those sorts of um, added professionals don't have anything to bring to the party and they so often do. We've made some brilliant resources as well that we're more than happy to share with you to go along with this short um, discussion courses that we're doing. Um, so please get in contact if you would like more information. I'm going to hand you over now to Claire and Helen for their conversational piece from the carer's experience. Um, and again, I'd just like to really thank Helen for participating in our meeting today. I hope it'll be a real benefit for a lot of you out there. So hello everyone, I'm delighted to be here today with the wonderful Helen who supports her lovely husband Philip who's diagnosed with Lewy body dementia. So thank you so much for joining me here today Helen, it's really lovely to have you and I wonder if you would be able to start by telling us a little bit about the process of Philip getting his diagnosis. Um, of course, yes. First of all, I want to thank Mahoko, who spoke at the last Carers Conference, because she, she imparts such warmth and um, kindness. And I've spoken to her once or twice at the full Carers meeting that we had face to face. And uh, I just wanted to just say hello to her and thank her for her bravery for speaking out. It really touched me. But anyway, yes, I can I can talk about um, our experience. Um, Philip was diagnosed in October 2016 and I guess in terms of the length of time taken uh, to reach a diagnosis, we only started searching for a diagnosis in March 2016. Uh, so I guess it's relatively a short period of time but obviously looking back Philip's problem started a lot earlier than that. Um, but the first thing that happened was uh, we both had very busy jobs, hardly, you know, having real conversations as you do when you're in that stage of life. You, you're just getting on with the things that need to, you know, waiting for the weekends and, and, and you know, maybe having fun at the weekends, but um, just ships in the night otherwise. And that was fine, that was okay, except that one uh, night Philip very quietly um, obviously wanted to talk about something that was troubling him, so um, which is very unusual. So obviously I, I stopped and, and listened and he said that he thought he was mentally ill and um, that was huge. A, it was huge because uh, we'd both been so capable and, um, you know, wrapped in our work and we, we sort of shared this busy life. And then suddenly th this was a statement that couldn't be ignored. And because it was so unusual, you know, you just had to sit up and take notice. So um, as it was, uh, I had been thinking of leaving my full-time job anyway because it had become very stressful and looking back it was also because I knew that Philip was struggling and I just thought we can't carry on and I remember talking to a clinician friend and saying several months earlier um, that Philip seemed to have lost all his confidence and um, and in social gatherings where he used to be the first to talk to people um, he was the last um, but when he said that he thought he was mentally ill I thought right it's time to put this to the fore 
front of our lives and sort it out. So I gave up work um, very rapidly <laughs> um, to help Philip. And um, I, I know that's not everybody's uh, choice or it's not everybody's, um, it, it's not easy for everybody to do. So I'm not saying that this was the right way or anything. It's just the way that we've had a very long marriage um, and Philip's always supported me. I just thought that that was such a big statement of his that I, I had to respond. We sought um, a GP appointment and I guess that was the first stumbling block. Our own GP, Philip's own GP, was on six weeks sabbatical. So um, the first appointment we could get with him uh, was at the beginning of June. So we thought, and, and otherwise it would be a locum. And we thought with something so important, we wanted his own GP. Um, so we waited till the beginning of June, but uh, we started compiling a list of things that weren't right. And by the time June came, we had a long list. Anyway, we went to see the GP and he unfortunately wasn't very sympathetic. And he didn't look at our list. He said, give me one thing that you're worried about. <laughs> that wasn't terribly helpful. And so Philip said, well, he can't remember things very easily. He did a quick sort of memory test. He covered up some items on the, the table. How many can you, you remember? And Philip couldn't remember uh, more than two, I think. And uh, so he said, oh, well, that's very curious. I'm going to send you to a neurologist. We actually saw the neurologist very quickly, which is great. And he said, well, there are a number of things. There are, well, he said there are hundreds of things that could be wrong, but let's start ruling things out. And Philip had a um, a month's trip to China, which I went, um, I went with him and I could really see that something was very badly wrong. Uh, very disturbed sleep habits. He, he couldn't think or arg argue very logically a, a case and, uh, and his speech was failing quite badly. So I knew that something was very wrong and then so did he and then when we got back from uh, China um, we we went to see consultant number two who did some tests and at the end of the test he said uh, I'm pretty sure um, that you have Lewy body dementia. That was such a blow but having said that I thought it made sense. Um, Philip wasn't so sure, but to compound matters, um, the very next day, consultant number one rang and said, I think this diagnosis is too hasty. And he said, I'm going to refer you to consultant number three. We saw him, he was very, very good. And he said, yes, I think I can confirm this is Lewy body dementia. Philip then had a DAP scan in the following February. And consultant number three said the DAT scan is consistent with Lewy body dementia. And it was then that Philip accepted the diagnosis. But um, I accepted it when consultant number two said it in October. <laughs> so it wasn't long and drawn out in terms of what other people go through. But because of the uncertainty or, and people saying, yes, it's this and no, it's not, it was it was quite confusing um, because then you, you, you just think, well, what do we do? Um, Thank you so much for explaining that, Helen. It sounds like, as you say, it might not have been a very long journey overall, but that it was a really complex journey to getting that diagnosis. And also thank you for explaining the differences in, in Philip accepting it and, and you accepting it as well. So you kind of touched on there about what to do next after you get that diagnosis. So what, what support have you and Philip found helpful following on from the diagnosis? 
Well, um, the same, same, the same as the sort of shock when consultant number two said you've got this diagnosis and await a letter in the post, and that was it. When we saw consultant number three, he said, um, "I'll see you again in eight months' time." And although he's a, a, he's he, he's fantastic, he's very good. That that's normal, and it was absolutely extraordinary to me that that was it a life changing diagnosis and there was nothing and no support um and we went home when we formed a sort of battle plan ourselves <laughs> is what we wanted and what we were going to do going forward so we had our plan um of who to tell, when to tell them, uh, and we were refining all the time. Uh, but no, we didn't have any any input um, at all um, at first, and that was pretty scary because I, I just thought, is this is this going to be it? You know, is this all that we get? An appointment every eight months. It was two years without any input at all. When we were at one of the regular meetings with the consultant, new, um, neurologist, uh, there was a, a woman there from Young Dementia Oxfordshire, uh, who's, who works with the voluntary group. And from that point, everything changed. Um, she was fantastic, absolutely wonderful. She came to our house. She sat down and talked to us for a couple of hours about what we wanted and where we were going and how Philip was coping, what we were going to do, um, and talked through the options uh, with us. And that was the beginning of the support that we've had. And she booked us on to an ADAPT course, um, which was a series of six sessions. Um, dealing with different aspects of um, having a diagnosis of dementia. They, they were very informative and very useful and I came up with lots of information about actions to take which we hadn't taken and, and it was great to have a checklist I could start to work through like power of attorney um, and the financial stuff everything um, but she also then put us in touch with some support groups and the combination of Young Dementia Oxfordshire and the UCR support groups, it, it has been the best thing, I'd say. Um, we no longer feel we're on our, we're on our own. Uh, we no longer feel we have to, to make the decisions without anybody to consult. We have colleagues in the Young Dementia of Oxfordshire that we used to meet on a regular basis two maybe three times a month uh, both um, like myself the partners and those with a diagnosis so we have quite a few people that we know very well um, and then the carers group at UCL and Philip's part of the VIP group, which he really enjoys. Um, and other things like uh, Turtle Song, which uh, is a singing and music group that Philip was part of. All of those things ha has added, I don't want to be, uh, I, don't, I don't know how to explain it, but a warmth to our life, which was probably dissipating <laughs> after two years of coping with it on our own and feeling more and more socially isolated and uh, not really knowing how to tell our wider group obviously we told our family um, and close friends but you know the wider group so being able to substitute things that you've lost um, because of the diagnosis with a group of people both professionals and um, fellow travellers on this <laughs> awful diagnosis uh, has been the best thing.
and during lockdown all of that moved on to zoom and although we do miss a lot in the face-to-face -face, um, meetings we there's a lot that you don't get uh, the zoom is been a lifesaver in lockdown i mean it, it really has uh, it gives us people to talk to activities to do it keeps Philip engaged, both socially and mentally. Thank you, Helen, for describing that. I'm sorry it took a long time to get to that support, but I'm so pleased that you've that you've made it there now and that it's been really helpful for both of you. Yeah. Yes. So, so it was it's interesting to, to because we know what it was like without the support and what it was like with the support. Um, so we we're in a good position to know how it feels and it just feels awful not to have any support. I think a lot of people talk about getting that diagnosis and then feeling alone like there's no one else there for you. Absolutely. So Helen, just one final question. Is there anything else that you think would be helpful for other carers to know just from your experience of supporting Philip? Well, the, the only one thing I can think of is when we did the ADAPT course, although it was two, two years into the diagnosis, it was the first bit of support we had. I found it really hard and uh, there were people at different stages of, of the diagnosis and um, again, I found that very, very difficult because you're forced to confront things that you're not yet confronted. Uh, by and uh, well my philosophy now after four years <laughs> is only think about today you know we do have things that we're thinking of doing but not too far ahead um, I my advice is to to concentrate on today and what you can do today what the good good things in your life are and focus around those and we, which is very much what we've done we've picked out the things that we really enjoy and we have focused on those. Thank you, Helen. I think that's that's so powerful what you said there to make some plans for the future and prepare where you can, but really focus on the now and those positives as well. I think that's fantastic what you're doing there. And it, it really shows speaking to you and to Philip that you do focus on the now and what you can do, which is fantastic. Thank you. So, Long may it continue. <laughs> absolutely. So, Helen, thank you so much for sharing your experiences and for being so open about how the diagnosis has impacted on both of you. Uh, we're really looking forward to ha having Helen join us in the Q&A portion of today's meeting as well. Um, but just thank you again, Helen. It's been wonderful speaking with you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Claire. You know, if I can just add my thanks to both um, Claire and Helen for that um, really inspiring piece and that sense that not being alone is absolutely critical to uh, pretty much everything we want to do here at Redmond to support. Thank you. It is brilliant. Thank you, Helen. So honest. And um, if you if you haven't got support out there, you haven't dabbled your toe in that water, please take advice from Helen. It's never too late to get support. And I think, you know, she's really demonstrated what a difference it's made into their lives. Right, continuing on now, we're going to the uh, uh, the recording that Alicia and Chris has done for the staging. And um, I hope this will be really helpful for you out there. Thank you. For those who I haven't met before, my name is Alicia Willoughby. I'm working with Seb, Emma and Keir to reshape and further develop the stages of PCA document. Uh, and hi, I'm Chris. Uh, I've helped to run the PPA support group for a number of years uh, and I'm a researcher working alongside Professor Jason Warren to study PPA. And I also work with uh, Professor Seb Crutch as the education officer for uh, Redmond support. So today, Alicia and I are going to say a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing to try to define stages of uh, some of the red mentors that we work with. And we think that 
and, and uh, what we hear from members is that this is really important because at the moment when somebody receives a diagnosis of a rare dementia they might intend to have entirely reasonable questions like uh, what care will I need and when will I need it what will happen to me next and how long can I keep working for and sadly at the moment all that we can really say with any honesty is that we don't know and we'd like to be able to change that. So this document may look familiar to some of you. It's an extract from the stages of PCA and we know from the feedback we've received just how useful this document has been. Carers have told us that it's a huge help for understanding what their loved ones with PCA are experiencing and that it is also a great tool to pass on to GPs and other healthcare professionals who may not be familiar with PCA. The positive feedback assured us that creating these staging documents was something we had to continue with. So just before we, we go on to talk about the stages, we thought it might be helpful to very quickly go through the different rare dimensions that we support and, and talk briefly about how they fit together. And this gets quite complicated quite quickly, but essentially uh, the rare dimensions we support tend to be caused by proteins that are present in all of our brains, but then at some point, uh, for some reason start to malfunction causing damage to that to those brain cells and, and then causing the symptoms that people with rare dementia uh, experience to occur. And so the dementias that we currently support can be split into the three main categories uh, that we've put up here. So uh, those that are typically caused by Alzheimer's disease proteins, those that are typically caused by frontotemporal lobe bar degeneration proteins and those that are typically caused by Lewy bodies. And this is of course a, a bit of a simplification but broadly speaking uh, PCA, uh, young onset Alzheimer's disease, logopenic aphasia and familial Alzheimer's disease all tend to have the same problems with the same proteins that we see with typical uh, memory-led Alzheimer's disease and, and here the only difference is that the proteins are causing damage to different parts of the brain so parts of the brain involved with say vision in PCA and language in uh, logopenic aphasia and where we've included a thick border here ind indicates where we have a specific support group for that particular diagnosis. Under the FTLD banner, we, we have the, these uh, diagnoses like behavioral variant FTD, semantic dementia, progressive non-fluent aphasia, and familial frontotemporal dementia. And then under the Lewy body banner, we have dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's disease dementia. And at RDS, we, we sort of bring this together under the banner of Lewy body dementia. We do the same for, for these, uh, these diagnoses grouped together under the banner of frontotemporal dementia and then for primary progressive aphasia uh, as well, which, I've, uh, which we've circled here. And so it's PPA and PCA that Alicia and I are going to talk about her work to create stages of today. So with the PPA work, we actually had a, a running start almost because this is uh, something that we're able to learn from the experience of, of the PCA team and the work that they'd already undertaken with the stages. So we had a rough idea of what we were aiming to do. And the first step um, was to go through medical records and research data from 10 people with each main PPA subtype. Uh, and these people had all very generously given us permission to look at their clinical data uh, and had taken part in our research. So we had a very rich data set, uh, data set on which to base uh, these initial ideas. And, and using this information, we developed four stages for each PPA subtype, ranging from uh, very early to severe. And at that point, we asked many of you, so members of the PPA support group, uh, for feedback on the stages that we had developed. And we were pretty overwhelmed by the responses. This is just a snapshot of some responses in one subtype of PPA uh, to one stage within that subtype. So we were really, really inspired and really pleased by, by the amount of feedback that we had. Some of this feedback was really positive. They, they, they thought we'd done um, some, some really good things. Other people made some really helpful suggestions and, and a common suggestion was that we hadn't quite captured the range of symptoms and that we were missing a stage between stages three and four. And an, another sort of strand of the feedback was that we hadn't um, necessarily captured the full range of the, of the disease in terms of uh, what happened after our, our proposed stage four. So we have changed that now and, and so we moved from a four stage system to uh, basically a six stage system uh, ranging from very mild to profound. We've done this of course for each of the PPA variants separately and our next step was to build another online survey and we asked PPA members again to give feedback and uh, again we were blown away by the response. We got over 100 unique responses. We don't have time to go through all of these now um, but just to give you an idea of the type of data we got and, and how we're working with it. I'm going to uh, zoom into one stage of one PPA subtype. So here we have stage two of progressive non-fluent aphasia and you can see the different symptoms on the left hand side. 
And on the right hand side, I've put the different percentages of, uh, of people who answered the survey who thought that each symptom had been accurately placed in our proposed stage two. And we used a traffic light system here. So, uh, so the green in the stage two column is good because it means that the majority of people uh, agreed that the symptom had been placed in, in, our, in, in the right stage. There's some disagreement. There's, uh, there's some sort of people who, who think it that symptom might have been more accurately placed in say stage three or, so, or stage one but by and large there's there's that's something approaching a consensus which is really really helpful and really positive and this uh, this pattern seems to be uh, across all of the stages uh, across all of the subtypes so although we'll have to change uh, a few symptoms we'll have to uh, remove a, a few of the proposed symptoms and, and edit some of them it looks like broadly uh, we're, we're very nearly there with, with these stages which is really exciting just to talk about some of the uh, the next steps we'd like to take with this this work. We've listed some some ideas here, just to say that these aren't necessarily sort of sequential. Um, these are things that we'd like to do in parallel. So, firstly, we uh, we're hoping to do some computer modelling um, with uh, a new PhD student who's who's just started working with us, and we're very excited to have on, on board. We'd like to validate the, the work in English and in, in foreign languages uh, as well. And we're really excited that uh, sort of a team of international collaborators has said they'd like to, to take part. So we've got people from Harvard, Melbourne and Sydney who, who are keen and we're hoping to, to recruit people from, uh, from Spain and Germany uh, as well. A really important test will be whether clinicians uh, can and, and will use uh, these stages internationally. So that's a piece of work that we're looking to do as well and I think most importantly um, we'd like to release these stages to, to RDS members as, as well so we're hoping that that will be uh, happening as soon as we possibly can. So our reason for reworking the stages of PCA is to ensure it fits as accurately as possible with as many people's experience as possible. To get started we went through the original document with help from some of our PCA support group members we thought about what was missing and how we could make it more useful. From there, we created a questionnaire that was refined many times to ensure we would be collecting all the data necessary to make the PCA stages volume two a well-informed document. Following the PCA support group in December, we sent out an email containing the questionnaire and asked you to complete it. The questionnaire takes the symptoms laid out in the first staging document and asks, is this in the correct stage? where you can indicate yes, no it was earlier, or no it was later. We then ask how prominent was this symptom, and some additional questions about strategies you found useful, health or social care professionals you had useful contact with, and for any other comments you might wish to make. Within the questionnaire, we also ask about some features that weren't well covered in the first document, such as behaviour and mood and sensory changes, which we know do occur. We tried to make the questionnaire as accessible as possible and also offered phone calls to gather responses for those living with PCA. This made sure everyone who wanted to could help out with this project and so far we've had over 100 responses. We will be taking a first look at the data next week, so if you haven't already and would like to complete the survey, you can still access it using the link sent out in this email in December. If you're unable to complete an online survey, then please send an email to me at a.willoughby at ucl.ac.uk and I will gladly arrange a convenient time to call. And just to say that the work that we've put into the PCA and PPA staging systems is something that we hope will very much be translatable to the other dimensions that we support as well. So please uh, do watch this space. We know how important this work is and it's something that we're incredibly passionate about getting right. So thank you. Huge thanks to Chris and Alicia and continued apologies from me if you find it difficult to hear what I'm saying with all this rain drumming on my rooftop. I'll rely on Nikki to wave at me if it's completely un unhearable. Um, I just wanted to flag, um, I'm obviously biased and I think there's huge value in the work that Chris and Alicia um, were just describing. Um, but I also wanted to flag the fact that we very much recognise this is a balance between doing what Helen recommended in her talk with Claire of living day to day, living for the day, 
um, and that balance between that and planning ahead, looking forward. And I think there's a little bit in all of us um, that swings between those two camps and dallies a bit in the middle. And I think the idea of the stages is that when you want to, or if you want to, or in those moments when you want to look ahead and think what may uh, come next, then there's a controlled and measured way of doing that. It's not the sort of jumping forward and seeing a life that you never anticipated or can't relate to, which is many, many steps further down the track from where you are. It's about being able to take those steps in a controlled way to give you control over what information you receive and when. Thank you. Thank you. And um, some of you may have noticed on Chris's slides that he mentions the Young Onset Alzheimer's Disease Support Group. Um, and this is new. We'll be launching that this year. So we'll be having our very first meeting in March and um, we'll be welcoming uh, new members to come and join the group for that. So it's a really exciting step forward for us. We're now going to go on for our last presentation, and this is all about assisted technology. Tips, strategies and recommendations that we've gathered from our members and from other health professionals. So I'm going to hand over to my lovely colleagues, Claire and Livy, to present um, some recommendations for you. Thank you. Hello, it's Livy and Claire here from the direct support team. We're delighted to be here today to talk a little bit about assistive technologies, activities and adaptions. This absolutely won't be an exhaustive list of suggestions or resources. And we know how strategies that work for some people don't work for others, but this is just a general idea of what might be available. If you would like a more depth, in-depth discussion with a member of the direct support team, please do email us at contact at redmentorsupport.org. And also just to let you know, we're gonna be sending out the information. So don't worry about scribbling down all the links that we're gonna be going through today. So we're gonna start by talking through the process of accessing more formalized assistive technologies through the local authority or through the NHS following a needs assessment. Firstly, it can be really beneficial to have a needs assessment from the local authority to determine what the person living with dementia might need support with. This can also enable onwards referrals to specialists, such as occupational therapists, or for those whose vision is impacted by their dementia, rehabilitation officers for visual impairment through the local sensory team, although this is dependent on the area that the person lives. These professionals look at the way the individual interacts with the environment and then suggest adaptations and assistive technologies that may enable that individual to be more independent in their daily activities. You can also be referred to an occupational therapist through the GP or you can choose to pay for an appointment by going privately. Some of these devices might be provided by the council Others they may suggest and then you would need to pay for these yourself. Examples include medication reminders, which are particularly useful for people living on their own, and digital clocks to help orientate someone living with dementia. There's also what's referred to as telecare and telehealth services. So telecare includes devices that are used to facilitate independence and enhance personal safety. This might include things like community alarms, sensors and movement detectors, and the use of video conferencing to communicate with carers. Telehealth, on the other hand, allows clinicians to monitor chronic diseases at a distance using technology, which is something that is used more frequently now due to coronavirus. And we're going to talk a little now about off-the-shelf or self-funded assistive technologies. And these are devices purchased from families directly from the private sector. So as well as a formal needs assessment through the local authority, there's also that option of buying our technology and adapted products online. We've included some websites here that might be, help, might be a helpful starting point to give you an idea of what is available, but you might want to use these websites to search for a particular device 
and then search on other websites to see if you can find a less expensive version somewhere else before purchasing. So do shop around. Again, this is absolutely not an exhaustive list. We particularly want to highlight Ask Sara. Now, this is a website developed by occupational therapists where you can answer specific questions about your needs and they will suggest resources and devices that may be suitable for you. It's also important to be aware that some products that are specifically designed to aid people with disabilities may be eligible for VAT relief. And here is a link to the government website where you can find out a bit more about this. So we've heard from a huge number of Rare Dementia Support members about the different adaptations, technology and devices they've used to enhance their independence and enable them to do activities that they enjoy. We will just cover a few of these in this section, but there are many more examples of the creative ways that people have adapted their everyday activities. So a number of Rare Dementia Support members have said that smart devices have been really helpful. So they're able to do things like set reminders, listen to music and audiobooks, and even link with different devices in their home, such as smart lights. People who may have difficulty with reading due to visual or language impairments might find it enjoyable to engage with things like podcasts, audiobooks and quizzes, and there's a huge variety of quiz shows on the television that don't necessarily require visual input in order for people to participate and get enjoyment out of this. There are also a number of different GPS devices available. So this includes things like smartphone apps, for example, Find My Friends or What Three Words, or wearable devices like GPS watches or trackers that can be worn around the neck. In the earlier stages, having something as simple as an app on the person's phone might just provide some additional confidence and reassurance to enable independence for that person. In terms of accessibility, smartphones, tablets and laptops may have their own inbuilt accessibility settings. So things like text to speech function, for example. And there are also apps and software that you can download to increase the accessibility of your device if the person that you're supporting has difficulties with things like vision and or communication. Finally, it's also a good idea to look at the person's living space and see if there are adaptations to the environment that might help. So for example, making sure that there's good lighting levels and removing trip hazards and having very clear visual cues as well. So we're going to take a moment to focus mainly on cooking now. And we've heard from our members how important it is to ensure that everything a person is likely to need is in reach and is easy to use. So for example, the cooker, can the person still operate it? Could controls be labeled to allow the person to cook? Or could assistive technology such as temperature monitors um, in the room help? If you're worried about leaving taps running or being able to turn the taps on and off, then there are a number of different items that can help. You could use a special plug that will release water from the basin if it gets too full, as detected by the pressure of the water. And if the, the taps are a bit stiff or fiddly, you can get um, special tap turners, which are color coded red and blue, so it's obvious which one is hot and cold, and provide a long handle for plenty of leverage. Now, many of our members has found electric cooker guards helpful. These can be set with a specific time that the, de the device can be left on for. And if the appliance is left on for longer than this, or the temperature goes higher than it should, an alarm will sound. You can also buy knives with specially shaped handles, which make things easy to control when cutting. Make sure you have an automatic can opener that's easy to use. And you might also want to look at liquid level indicators, talking labels, talking weight scales. And also the Ninja Kitchen range has been a huge success with our members in getting there and finding their love for cooking again. A bit about behavior changes. So maybe simplify cooking, have fewer and less complicated steps. 
choose tasks that can be easily achieved. In terms of changing communication, cooking together allows you to give gentle reminders and also monitor safety. And if mobility is affected, then you might want to look at adapted knives, etc., and maybe even perching stools. So gardening can be a really relaxing and sensory stimulating activity and has also been shown to raise self-esteem. We know that not everyone has access to a garden and for people that don't, gardening might involve even taking care of an indoor plant instead. For people with dementia whose vision is being impacted, it might be beneficial to use bright tape or paint and contrasting colours to help with distinguishing edges of paths and steps and potentially using weatherproof and slip resistant paint as well as outdoor lighting to help minimise the risk of falls. You might also like to use contrasting colours in terms of pots or flower beds and the colours of plants as well. Gardening also doesn't have to rely completely on visual perception. So for example, somebody might really enjoy the feeling of mixing soil with their hands, of having different textures of different plants to feel. In terms of smell, you can have really fragrant flowers. You can also do things like herb gardens, which can be grown inside as well can give off really strong scents and stimulate the taste sense as well. In terms of hearing, there are things like using bird feeders or wind chimes to stimulate that sense. As we spoke about with cooking, gardening can also be broken down into more manageable steps for the person with dementia. And you can provide visual prompts and work together to make things both achievable and enjoyable. Additionally, for people who might find routine really important, gardening could be built into their usual routine. So for instance, maybe watering or clearing leaves on particular days or times. For people who may have impaired mobility, there are also adapted tools and devices that are available. And here we've included the link to Carry On Gardening, which has additional suggestions on how to make gardening more accessible for people to help enjoy it. So we thought, we thought we'd finish our lovely talk today with some great quotes from our members. And just to a reminder that it's not a one-fits-all approach to choosing assistive technology. What works for one person may not work for another. For example, one person might find it really helpful to have a recorded message reminding them to take their keys with them, while another person might find this confusing. It can help to think carefully about specific needs, capabilities, and consider what benefits of using the technology might be. We really hope that the talk today has been helpful. If you'd like to discuss assistive technologies further or support in general, please do contact us at contact at rarededementiasupport.org. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Wow, lots of some amazing tips and strategies from Claire and Livy. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And it just a reminder, as Claire and Livy emphasised, that the idea with these meetings is us for to throw out lots of ideas, different perspectives and options. We realise it's a lot to take in and the team are here to talk with you about which of those um, options might be appropriate for you, how they might need to be tailored or shaped to your own circumstances and preferences. Um, and we very much know it's not a one size fits all, but lots of food for thought there, we hope. Great, well, thank you. That um, brings us to the end of the um, presentations. And now we thought we would um, spend the time remaining uh, together in a question and answer session. So I'm going to invite back our panel um, so as they rejoin on their cameras, um, that's Trish O'Hara. So Trish, as you know, is a member of our direct support team and our rights and entitlements officer. Um, Helen, um, the wonderful RDS member who kindly shared her experiences earlier. Helen, welcome back. Um, Hannah, um, who's the RDS Admiral Nurse and a key member of the direct support team. Antoinette O'Connor, who many of you will know, who's a neurologist and research fellow and key, key member of the Dementia Research Centre. Um, and also Claire Waddington, who you've just been hearing from. 
welcome back all. Um, so I'm going to dive straight in and please do, as we are engaged in this question and answer session, please do continue to feel free to share your thoughts, your reflections, your comments, as well as any questions you have. And I will try and give voice to those if you can hear me okay um, and try to direct those to relevant members of our panel. So we'll start with um, a, a big and important issue, which I think lots of people relate to um, in, in one way or another, which is uh, one of the people present has said, my wife has a rare dementia and we don't discuss this openly between ourselves or our close family members, nor do we talk about what may happen in the future. We are both experiencing depression and I wanted to ask whether you would recommend us talking openly about the situation and the future or not. Um, I wondered if it might be, and um, I think a lot of us will probably have views on this. I wondered, um, Helen, if we might start with you, if that's okay. Um, and then perhaps come to Hannah and Antoinette and anyone else who would like to contribute. But this question about should we talk about these things openly or not? Helen, what's your view? Oh, well, um, there are a number of views in our uh, group. Um, we found it very difficult um, to know who to tell and when to tell. It's definitely one of the most difficult things, especially um, as Philip was only 58 and still working. You know what, uh, and we were trying to manage that the working aspect. And um, there are some people in our group that say, uh, "Be brave, be honest, and that's fine." we were not so brave um we have talked about it very openly between us philip and i um, and i think that's really important i think if, if anything you need to start there uh, and start talking about it and being very honest because you're, you're going to go forward together as a team and and if you're not on the same page it's going to be really difficult for both of you so i think that's my first thing um, our priority was to present a united front for our children, I call them children, but you know they, they were in their early twenties uh, um, and we wanted, we didn't want to destabilize the blossoming of their life, if you, if you like. Um, it was they're at, they were at that age where they were just going out into the world, getting jobs, first jobs, first relationships, whatever. So it was important for us to be stable for them um so that was a priority for us so we concentrated on first of all ourselves what we understood what we wanted to do then we told the children when we were sure what we felt uh, and that was difficult to manage that each reacted in very different ways um Four and a half years later, I think they're all in a, a much better place than they were at the beginning. Um, we then told some key friends that uh, live in our village that we saw every day and we had, um, you know, ongoing social support from and they continue to be very important to us. Um, and uh, when they've made us feel as though we're not alone and they're very thoughtful um, but I have to say that not everybody is thoughtful not by any malicious design people generally are willing but they don't know how to be supportive and, and because it's such a scary thing and it was we're not exempt from that we it, it was scary for us if we had thought before Philip had this, this diagnosis that Philip was going to be diagnosed, I think we would have been really scared. Um, but now we're in it, it's not so scary. <laughs> um, so it's important to have those levels of communication. Um, after that, we then expanded to a wider group, but only selectively. And there are a lot of people that don't know still. Um, and um, that's how we've managed it so we haven't told everybody we haven't been the brave soldiers that other people have been uh we've tried to manage it is that okay 
That's incredibly helpful, Helen. And I think you've you've been very honest about not finding it easy, which is really helpful. I think particularly in this situation and talking about the value of doing it gradually. I think sometimes we can view many situations and challenges in life as black and white. And the, the gradual way you've approached this, I think, is really helpful. The opportunity to to test out how you tell people to make a plan about who you tell people first, to find a language for the two of you to say what you know we're the team at the center of this what how, how are we talking about this together and of course that would be easier for some than others but no incredibly helpful thank you would anybody else like to come in on, on that question Anna um, it's really a hard decision to share information about diagnosis often it's accepting that diagnosis first and it can be challenging um, to accept it and people if it was if it's a rarer type as well, generally people don't understand about the rarer types and it's such an individual situation to share a diagnosis and the support, but the support you can get by sharing it is really powerful and, and that sense of isolation that some people might feel um, and every family is different, a diagnosis of dementia doesn't just affect the person, it affects so many people involved and um, it's a very challenging and often talking about a diagnosis is hard, um, sometimes just giving people information, information sheet about the type of dementia and um, they may not want to pick when you go in social events, people might not pick up on um, the symptoms of dementia, but by reading and having that information they can understand what people might find challenging and make that, try and ease that anxiety as well for the whole family and Sometimes people don't have to say anything, but if you know people know, it, it can be really powerful and, and hard, especially with the younger onset as well. It's out of the blue, unexpected, and people don't always associate with younger people with dementia. So um, it's a very individual thing um, to be able to share and support the family. And people react differently as well, and that's and that's okay. We're all, all different, and we accept and um, deal with different challenges differently. So, but it's that support that you can get from professionals and friends which can be really powerful and um, which can be vital. Claire. Um, I just want to specifically address the part of the question that talks about the symptoms of depression that they're both experiencing. So I think if a person with dementia is experiencing feelings of depression and or anxiety, it's really important that that's addressed um, and that that person is reassured and that they're validated about the feelings that they're experiencing as well. Um, so if it's something that you're not able to talk about as a couple because it's too difficult, it's important as Helen and as Hannah have touched on to have that space where you are able to share with someone how you're feeling. So it, as a carer, it's important that these feelings of depression are addressed as well. So whether that's through counselling, through the local carer centre, or by speaking to a member of the Rare Dementia support team just to talk through what other local support might be available for you. But please don't experience these symptoms without getting additional support for them. Great. Can I, I'm just going to throw in, just before I throw it over to Antoinette, there's a related question um, which is someone has raised, which is my husband does not accept his diagnosis of FTD and therefore we are unable to have conversations about planning in the future and who to tell. How do others deal with this? And I wondered, Antoinette, if you could perhaps start us off picking up on that point as well as what you were going to say. Yeah, I just, just wanted to echo what Claire was saying about depression, and that is very common, um, both for carers and those living with dementia, and it kind of a really negative impact on how we engage with others and on memory and thinking. So it's really important to get that addressed, and it harks back to the earlier talk with with Nikki uh, about involving your GP as well and you know taking time for both yourself and um, you know those living with dementia and having time to get your needs addressed and you know getting it's a treatable condition and getting it addressed with psychological support or, or medication is is really really important um, and then to, to move on to the next question and I think it it comes a little bit about what Helen spoke earlier about there being the right time in different stages and you know a new diagnosis is, is a very difficult time um, and it's a lot to take on board and I think you know as time moves on people gain more acceptance and that can change so it, 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 it's something that shifts over time and it needs to you know it's not something that can be forced but it's something that you may notice like gradually 
changes changes over time and even if there is difficulty with talking between and, and insight into a condition it doesn't mean that one can't access wider support and talk to others about what's what's going on so if anyone else wants to chip in Chris. Yeah, I think um, I think denial about any diagnosis isn't unusual, to be honest. And I think the carer in that situation is in the most difficult position, particularly in appointments, actually. And sitting in an appointment with someone um, who is essentially quite often lying to their healthcare professional, their GP or whatever, and you're next to them as the carer thinking, well, this isn't this isn't how it is. This is not the truth. This isn't the truth at all. And actually, I think healthcare professionals for a long time, when they supported people living with any condition, particularly dementia, they always spoke to the carer. And I think there's been a lot of drive for them to only speak to the patient. And now there sometimes is a situation where the healthcare professional only speaks to the patient and the carer sitting there thinking, hang on, someone needs to ask me here. Someone needs to ask me. And I think as carers, we sometimes don't want to interrupt. We don't want to dominate the meeting. We don't want to appear like we're controlling the cared for. But I do think we have to hear it. We, we have to have our voice heard. And I think it's important for you to say to the doctor, whomever, can I also speak here? because I see things a bit differently. I experience it differently. And to say that you experience it differently isn't to completely disregard the person living with dementia's opinion, but it's just to say that you have a different point of view. And I think we have to all have those voices heard, really. That was it. That's really helpful. And it chimes with another comment um, from another member present who said, my husband also FTD and he has no insight into his condition so it's been important to have a realistic conversation with him I guess linked to that and to what um, Helen shared and, and Trish was just mentioning about the difficult position people find themselves in another member commenting Helen thank you so much you're honest for your honest and inspiring talk uh, it was on, uh, just with time in mind to a couple of quick factual questions so one person was asking about um, FTD projects. Uh, if you have FTD, are there any research projects available? Um, so absolutely, there are projects, uh, Jason Warren and John Rora in the Dementia Research Centre and many other centres run programmes looking at uh, changes over time in behaviour, in the shape of the brain and how the disease is affecting it. And also uh, Jason Warren in particular and his team trying to do research that helps to understand more complex behavioral challenges, changes in preference, in habits, in compulsions, in smell and taste and hearing and, and many other things besides. So yes, absolutely lots of opportunities. And also with the RDS team, opportunities linked to that and to take part in phone interviews um, about the RDS impact telephone survey to try and understand the impact of these conditions of any of the rare dementias, not just FTD, um, for people either living with the diagnosis or all of you caring for and about them. Um, one other quick question was about uh, Chris and Alicia's presentation about symptoms and when will that be available. So the original version of the PCA stages that Alicia mentioned is already available on the website. You just stop search for um, stages of PCA, um, but we can send that link around after the meeting. And Chris's stages, we hope, will be out um, in probably two to three months. Um, it's an uh, iterative process, so getting there bit by bit. So we'll ho it's hope it's something we'll be able to share soon and then keep refining over time with your input. OK, um, Trish, I wonder if I could come uh, to you for the next question, which is, my sister is a self-funding resident in a care home. Her savings are running out and her children have decided to sell her house, which is currently rented out, to realise further funds for her care. We have never asked the local authority for a care needs assessment. Should we be thinking about doing that now? My, ch my, sister's, children, uh, my sister's children have power of attorney. OK, yes, I think there does come a point where people need to start accepting that whilst you may not want the local authority to poke around your business or indeed your sister's business, a financial assessment here is really helpful. I think probably a financial assessment will give you sometimes confirm what you already know and that is that you have too much capital and a house if she's no longer living in it your sister and not likely to go back into it um, is is going to be considered capital and it will exceed 
the 23,250, which means that she will self-fund. Her children, of course, had one of them continue to live in it and had needs themselves or a spouse had lived in it, then they wouldn't have been able to sell the house. But it seems to me that the power of attorneys here, possibly their jointly power of attorneys, they've probably taken some advice, but I still would say a financial assessment from the local authority would be helpful for what happens in the future. And just to make sure that all her benefits are correct, that all her contributions are coming out of any other income that she's still entitled to. So it's it's a big picture and we need a social worker sometimes to come in and ask us a lot of questions. And that's your local authority, social workers will do the financial assessment. It is quite nosy, they, do, they will ask your sister all her business or her power of attorneys in this case, perhaps all her business, it depends on her capacity and it will be very revealing, but it will make sure that the local authority are offering everything they can offer, which may not be anything, but at least give you some good pointers for advice. Anybody else like to come in on that, on that point? Okay, that's fine, thank you. Um, uh, I wondered if I could start with you, Antoinette, for the next one, um, <coughs> um, excuse me, which is, um, uh, we, try to follow all of the suggestions on how to deal with my husband's delusions etc um, but when I'm suffering with loss of sleep and not as a patient um, as I should be there um, are there any other methods that I could try so dealing with one's own um, sleep challenges and the sort of ramifications of delusions and other behavioral challenges and um, maybe Antoinette and then um, Hannah and Claire could comment on that one. So first of all delusions are, are really really very difficult and, and just to sympathize with this person because I know it must be um, very very straining and especially in, in these times of lockdown you know it, there are less supports and less breaks so one will find oneself getting you know tired and and finding it more difficult to deal with so I think first of all you know one needs not to be too hard on oneself clearly you know you've done a lot of reading by the sounds of it and looked into you know those important things like behavioral modif you know behavioral and environmental changes to make you know making sure that triggers are minimized as much as possible such so that you know to re reduce the frequency of delusion so you know if there's known things taking a step back and looking what causes delusions when do they emerge are they particularly associated with poor lighting or are there some triggers they're associated with or some things in the environment and just trying to reduce the frequency because you will find once the delusions are there they can be quite difficult to manage and quite quite upsetting so I think taking a step back looking at the environment and trying to, to see if there's anything that is uh, particularly associated with them would be a really really important really important step but also trying not to be too hard on oneself if they do happen and not blaming oneself I think we all deserve to you know a bit of latitude at these times so just to, to go easy on oneself as well. Hannah I don't know if you want to Having sound issues, Claire. Yeah, Would you like to stop in first? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so just to yeah, completely agree with what Antoinette has said about making environmental modifications, um, looking at potential triggers for the delusions as well, and try and minimise those, and also being kind to yourself, which is one of the hardest things to do as a carer. We put a lot of pressure on ourselves as carers. Um, just to also say that if it's getting to the point where you're finding it very difficult to manage with these delusions on your own, you should seek additional support for this. So whether that's initially speaking to your GP, whether it might be helpful to have the community mental health team involved to give you some additional support, um, also whether the local authority could come in and do a needs assessment and whether it might be beneficial to have some additional care in the home as well, just to give you a bit of a break if this is something that's really, really sounding like it's hugely exhausting for you to be dealing with all the time. Look at me now, sorry, I have a bit of problem with my computer then. Um, and I think it's also, it's really challenging dealing with the delusions and um, especially when you can't see them, hear them and the challenges that that brings. And it's really important um, to document as well, if you can document when these are happening, um, as that can give you sort of pattern and you can reflect on and see 
um, and especially when you're feeling tired and the restrictions of lockdown, it's 24 hours a day you're caring for that person. Um, it's really important to have that structuring your day as well to so you don't burn out and have that time um, predict your day and um, so you feel better and stronger to be able to deal with the delusions. But um, it's really it's challenging and hard for carers, especially during the current situation. Can I say? Good. Is it all right? Can I come in? Is it okay? Um, I think it's also probably really helpful as well to look around the house, go into each room at different times of the day and see what might be happening in those rooms that you, you're used to because you're not worried about. But things like having a, a street light outside that has a tree in front of it that waves in the wind could send all sorts of dancing patterns around the bedroom wall, for instance. It might be helpful to get a blind just to black that out at night or to close off some windows completely with a blind constantly, have lights on uh, with down lighting, not up shadowy lighting like uh, Antoinette said, really think about lighting. Think about whether a floor looks slippy. Think about making it not shiny. It might not look as clean, but mat it off when you're washing it. Make sure it's matte so that people don't feel like they're falling or that they're in water. Just try and think about each room, look at it and think, what could this look like if you weren't sure? And what could it trigger? And as um, Hannah said, just write everything down when you see it happen, then look at the room, try and look at it from a fresh eyes and see if you can pick up what could trigger it. And there can be lots of things. Thank you, guys. That's really helpful. If I could just share a couple of other comments, uh, another uh, more praise for Helen. I would like to thank Helen. She gave such a clear account of her journey with Philip and I found it inspirational. Um, someone else commenting that in terms of that, having that conversation um, with with friends, with family, with professionals, someone has generously commented that the, your Many Faces of Dementia course on Future Learn is a good course to go through if you want to know more information without having to speak in person to someone. It's also an opportunity to speak with friends and colleagues if you want to share or if they want to learn more about the diagnosis. So thank you for that tip. Um, one other uh, comment or question is from someone about age, really. It's someone saying uh, we're both in our 70s. I got the impression that we were too old for young dementia. Uh, with the diagnosis just 11 months ago, I feel we fell into a void. Well, um, if you felt in a void, I hope you now feel well caught and received into a group of people who share many of your experiences. And yes, frustratingly, there are no clear relationships between age and type of dementia. We know that rarer forms of dementia are more common in younger people proportionally, but that doesn't mean uh, that it can't happen later. We have plenty of people with the visual, the language, the behavioural and other forms of dementia starting in 70s, 80s, even 90s. Um, and so it's it's that mix of finding both information about your condition, but also support that's um, appropriate to you, your life stage and your, 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 your wants and your preferences of how you want to live. So thank you for those comments. Um, one other which is uh, related to Livy and Claire's talk, which is we have recently discovered a device called a Sensate, which connects to your phone by an app. There are a series of meditations which you can play um, and enjoy. So that's a, another good recommendation. Um, a couple more quick practical ones just before we close. Um, one question is, having got power of attorney for finance and health and wellbeing, do you have to actually activate for a particular for particular purposes Trish okay these are these operate slightly differently so the financial power of attorney the, the donor whether they have when they have capacity they can pass that power on to you as the attorney so you can take on all their financial arrangements they can change their mind and say they want to they want to get back involved but sometimes people just think it's all too much they'll give it to their donor the person they've donated it to their attorney and say can you just sort that out for me and the attorney can do that it's kind of good good sense to keep a, uh, the person involved though and show them maybe bank statements or just keep a record of what's going on. I think that's a good, good thing to do. But also thinking about the health and welfare one differently and knowing that that doesn't and won't come into being unless the person loses capacity, in which case then the person who's the attorney starts to make best interest decisions uh, for that person. But it won't come into being until that point. Up until then, the person living with dementia is the full decision maker where possible.
Great, thank you. Um, one last question, if you don't mind me, I think on Radio 4 it's called busting the pips when you go slightly beyond you speak in continuity announcement slide slot. If anyone needs to go, please feel free. Uh, we've got more questions, thank you, and comments than we've got time to share, but I wanted to touch on this last one for those of you living with language-led uh, dementias or particular prominent language problems, and that's someone asking, do you have any advice for someone living by themselves with PPA? Um, Claire, I might come to you with this one first, if that's okay. It says, my father lives by himself and is beginning to struggle. We are looking at care plans but in this, for the time being. Is there anything um, we can do to help support him, especially in these COVID times when his interactions are limited? Absolutely. So I think this is probably something that would be better addressed one to one, just to go through exactly what, what needs your father has. Um, but just to say, that video calls can be really, really helpful for people with language-led dementias during COVID time. So a lot of people with language difficulties find it very difficult to communicate with people just over the phone. And a lot of communication comes from things other than just speaking. So it can be quite helpful to keep communication going like that. It's really helpful to let the local authority know that there is a person living with dementia that is living on their own and that you are caring at a distance for that person as well, just so they know who to contact if they need to. Um, and another thing that's really helpful to put in place um, is kind of visual prompts for things as well. So there's a lot of kind of easy read things that have pictures instead of words if they're finding things difficult to read, just to help with daily tasks. Um, there's a lot more probably that we can advise, but definitely please contact us one-to-one -to, -one to have more of a chat about what can be put in place to support that person. Thank you so much. Um, so my apologies um, that we haven't managed to uh, tackle all of the questions you kindly raised today, um, but we will try and add some comments uh, written or spoken um, in the email to you afterwards um, with any other bits of connection. Um, uh, some people have asked, uh, for example, is Alicia's project still ongoing? Yes, absolutely it is. We'll send you the link to that and a couple of other more specific uh, questions. And picking up on Claire's start of that last response is just a, again a reminder that we are here not just during meetings but between meetings. Please do get in touch for individual support with your questions, with your queries, or if you just want someone to talk to, to listen um, to the, um, the situation that you're facing at the moment. It's my only duty to uh, Nikki um, for co-presenting the meeting today and for all of our panel members for being here in the question and answer session and for their great contributions earlier in the meeting. And most importantly to all of you for making the time amidst your busy lives um, to come and be together not in the way we want, but I still hope in a in meaningful and positive way. Um, it's been a delight to have so many of you with us, over 100 people, over 100 computers, so we know that means over 100, well more than 100 people actually joining us together. So if you can try and pitch yourselves uh, toasting each other with a cup of coffee now and one of those fine Bokum cookies or some um, suitably appropriate and calorific um, treat, then I hope you can, we can wish you uh, all our very warmest wishes for the rest of your day and the week ahead. Please do be in touch and um, please do um, stay in contact with us and let us know of anything we can do to help you. Um, and I think we're going to close with a video from uh, the National Brain Appeal, which a few of you may have seen before. So thanks again for your time and especially to Alicia, Libby and many of the members of the team behind the scenes who've helped to bring you all together to here today. Thanks ever so much. Bye for now. Hello, my name is Eva Tate and I'm the Major Appeals Manager and Manager of the Rare Dementia Support Fund held the by the charity Dementia. The National Brain Appeal. The National Brain Appeal raises money as the dedicated charity for the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery and UCL Queen's Square Institute of Neurology. The National Brain Appeal raises funds for Rare Dementia Support's 2,000 members to help individuals living with rare and early onset forms of dementia, their families, friends and healthcare professionals. And we also hold several other funds for FTD and dementia research. The funding helps not only the support group meetings in London, but also the regional support groups, admin and support staff and all other associated expenses, including the new online support groups. When, when things return to normal, there are travel and accommodation bursaries available to help members attend the meetings. 
This year we've raised our fundraising target to 300,000 and this will rise further to 350,000 by 2022 to develop and extend the service in the areas of education, support and research with the ultimate aim that everyone affected by a form of rare dementia will have access to specialist information and support as well as contact with other people with a similar condition. We apply for grants from grant making trusts, foundations and livery companies and have a wonderful group of supporters, some of whom are here today, who fundraise for us in an amazing variety of ways. We would love it if you would like to sign up to our RDS fundraising newsletter to hear more of these stories and receive news of how we can support this community. We have had people do head shaves for us. We have had um, a gentleman drive across the Mongolian steppe in a VW polo and we have lots of people who take part in runs and virtual runs as well. At the end of February we held a gala dinner called Mission Possible where we raised 110,000 for the expansion of rare dementia support and we are delighted to announce that in line with this expansion the charity is committed to raise up to 7 million to create the world's first centre of excellence for rare dementias. If anyone would like to discuss any fundraising ideas or the new capital appeal um, please do feel free to email me or my colleague Alexis, our senior fundraising manager, who will speak about the innovative new ways you can be involved in fundraising for RDS, even during this challenging time. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Alexis Gebby and I'm the senior fundraising officer at the National Brain Appeal. Um, I just want to start off by saying a huge thank you to all of you who already fundraise for RDS. We really appreciate all of your incredible efforts, especially at this difficult time. My role at the National Brain Appeal is to look after all the amazing people taking on various fundraising activities for us. We have had people challenging themselves to run marathons, cycle long distances, climb mountains and even take on skydives, all whilst raising money for RDS. We also have wonderful fundraisers out in the community who organise golf days, hold coffee mornings, host choir and carol concerts, and even shave their heads. These people ensure that more people like you can be supported through Rare Dementia support. If you're interested in becoming one of our fundraising heroes, then please do contact me. I am here to support you with your fundraising, and I'm more than happy to chat about any ideas that you may have. While at the moment it isn't possible to take part in a sporting challenge or hold a big fundraising gathering in your local community, we do have some fundraising ideas, such as taking on a solo virtual run or walk, hosting a quiz for your friends or family online, asking for birthday donations in lieu of going out, or even donating money that you may be saving by not travelling to work or buying your daily coffee. Do get in touch with me if you would like to get involved. In the meantime, take care and we hope to see you soon.